All right, good morning, Crossroads fam. Good morning. Hey, good to hear from you guys. Good to see everybody in the house today. Is there joy in the house of the Lord today? I'm just curious. Yeah, amen. Well, as the ladies alluded, Pastor Lowell is, uh, is, is out of the house today. My name is Bobby Dion. I'm associate pastor here at Crossroads, and it's a, it's a rare occasion that I get to come up and, uh, and actually speak and share with you guys, and I'm, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to do it. Pastor Lowell will be back in the pulpit next, uh, next week and greets you guys all warmly. If you haven't been here the last several weeks, Pastor Lowell has been uh, going through a series called Get Out of the Boat. And as you, as you just saw in the bumper there, and uh, this, this sermon series has been based on some original content, um, some downloads that the Lord had given Lowell, and, and uh, he's got a few more messages to, to preach in this uh, series. But again, there's some original content, but there's also some content that Lowell has drawn from a book by a similar name. It's a book by uh, a guy named John Ortberg, a pastor who wrote a book called If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. So that's why the, the similar uh, series there. Um, but if you have, again, if you haven't been here, uh, just in, in brief summary, this series has been uh, in the book, uh, for that matter, are also drawn from Matthew 14, and there's a couple other, uh, a couple of other New Testament references to this particular occasion um, in the New Testament where where Jesus is recorded to and walked uh, walked on water. And then in the Matthew account specifically, uh, Peter gives this invitation, or uh, Jesus gives Jesus, Peter rather this invitation to come to him out on the water. And, and actually, it, it's, a, it's a, a very specific and unique calling that he gives to Peter um, because Peter calls out to, to him and, and, and Jesus says, come on, come on out of the boat. And so um, Pastor Lowe's done a great job um, just drawing out all of these inferences for us as the, as the body of Christ today. And uh, what I'm going to share with you guys today is, is actually sort of a, a, a bit of a rehash or a summary of a, of a teaching that I had the opportunity to do a couple of Wednesday nights ago. Um, for you faithful Wednesday nighters, I'm going to encourage you to just hang in there because, um, again, some of this material may be a bit of a, a review for you guys, but I, I will just say this. I don't know if this was true for everybody, but I know in, in uh, mine and Ashley's small group as well as uh, some other small groups, from what I understand, there was something about um, this, uh, this topic that seemed to strike a nerve with quite a few folks, and it's this, it's this notion of calling, all right? We, we hear that term used a lot. I mean, you, you, most, hopefully most pastors or people in full-time vocational ministry were called to the ministry. You hear that term used a lot. Um, but, the, but one of the inferences that I, I want to emphasize today with what I'm going to share with you guys is that we all have, as followers of Christ, we all have uh, universal callings, right? The Great Commission, the Great Commandment. There, there are things that we are all called to as followers of Jesus Christ. But what uh, John Ortberg is emphasizing in this particular chapter of the book that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share from is these, these unique callings, these special or individual callings that each of us as followers of Christ also have. And uh, Pastor Lowell is going to talk a little bit more on this particular point next week, but I, one of the things that, that uh, chapter 3 tries to make the point of is that as we explore our unique or individual callings, there's a difference between stepping out in faith, as Peter did in Matthew 14, and just making rash decisions and putting them under the banner of faith when, when they're really not uh, a faith-filled act, but rather a foolish act. And so I like this chapter because Ortberg, I think, does a good job of giving us some tools to explore our individual callings. I'm going to read this paragraph. He says in the book, the line between thou shalt not be afraid and thou shalt not be ridiculous is often a fine one and not easily located. Knowing when to get out of the boat and take a risk does not only demand courage, it also demands the wisdom to ask the right questions, the discernment to recognize the voice of the master, and the patience to wait for his command. Jesus is not looking for impulse-ridden adrenaline junkies. He's looking for people with the desire for adventure with God, the God gene. And he says, we all have one. It's part of our spiritual DNA. It requires both courage to take risks and wisdom to know which risks to take. So how do I discern the difference between an authentic call from God to get out of the boat from my own rash impulses? And he says, to probe this question, we have to consider the biblical notion of calling for starters. And again, I just want just to point out a couple of things about callings before I jump back into his material here. I, as I said a minute ago, we all have universal callings from God. But we all have individual callings, and I wonder, just I'll start, out, start off this message with a, with a preface, with a question. How many of us really believe that we have a calling, okay? And then for those of us who have had some experience exploring or walking out our callings, 
How many of you consider that sometimes our callings change or the Lord, the Lord calls us away from one thing and into a new thing? And for many of us, we, we grow comfortable in our current callings that we never even stop to consider perhaps the Lord is calling us to a different thing. Okay, so our callings can change. The other thing is, I just want to give this disclaimer, is that our callings uh, are not necessarily always our vocation or what we, what we do as, as work or to earn a paycheck. Oftentimes it involves that, but it, um, sometimes we get those things a little bit, a little bit twisted. Okay? So Orberg just says, you know, our, our calling is really a reflection of the fact that we are created in God's image. And if, if you're not familiar with this, I just want to quote from Genesis 1 in the very beginning. And this is, this is mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, but the very first time it's mentioned in Scripture is in Genesis 1, right there in the creation account. Because God said when he was about to go about making you and me, he said, let's make man in our own image according to our likeness. And let's let him rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. You know, right there in those verses, there's some, there's some hints to, um, to who God created us to be, uh, but, but more so what he created us to do. And I, here's a compelling question for you, and I don't know if you've ever given much thought to this. What does God do all day? You ever think about that? And I think it's a good question because I think if we don't ask the question, there might be this tendency to, to misconstrue what we think God does all day. Like maybe he's the bet Midler, he's watching us from a distance, right? Um, for some of us, unfortunately, what our perception is he's watching us, just waiting for us to mess up so he can smite us, you know, that, that sort of thing. But, but seriously, what does God do all day? And the, the, the answer to the question is God works. He works, right? You think, well, he's God, he doesn't have to work, you're right? Uh, but, but that's the reality. That's what Scripture says that God, that God does. So in, in, even in that creation narrative, you know, if you're familiar with it at all, you know that, that God worked for six days. And yes, on the seventh day he rested. But nowhere in Scripture does it say after that seventh day that God went into retirement. Okay? God is still intimately, actively involved in the daily workings of, of the earth and in, and in you and me and our lives uh, specifically. This is what the psalmist writes of God. In the Old Testament, you make springs gush forth in the valleys from your lofty home, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. Even in John chapter 5, Jesus himself is quoting as saying, My Father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Okay? So God, God works. And so if we recognize that God works and we're created in his image, then what we can infer from that is we have work to do as well. Right? And so, again, once we recognize that we do have a calling, and I hope that all of us do recognize that we do have a, a special, a sweet, unique calling, the next thing he says we need to do is we need to take our calling seriously. You know, as a crucial part of your calling, you were given certain gifts, certain talents, certain longings, and certain desires. And to identify these things with clarity, to develop them with skill, and to use them then joyfully and humbly to serve God and his creation is really central to why you and I were made in the first place. You know, the Connect class is going on right now. For those that don't know, our Connect class is, is just that. It's a means of, of helping people get connected here. But a couple of weeks of our Connect class are spent helping people do a spiritual gifts assessment, um, a, a studying and understanding, and then exploring uh, your, your own spiritual temp- temperament so as to get some clues as to how God put you together specifically, uniquely, so that you can step into your calling. So again, we need to take our calling seriously. And here's one thing, and I, I said this uh, that Wednesday night a few weeks ago, that I think is it's really important for all of us to hear, okay? And again, this is to every single one of you listening. This is the story of your life. You, 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 you. You are on a mission from God. In the book, he quotes the, the Blues Brothers. I guess that was like the thing the Blues Brothers did when they were traveling from place to place saying, we're on a mission from God, right? But it's true about you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And how about this? Here's a hard truth. Either that is true, family, or you have no purpose or no mission at all. And you're just, you're just kind of floating through you know, this life. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Lowell talked about the, you know, the, the dash between the dates on our tombstones. You're just, you're just kind of filling space until Jesus calls you home, right? So either that's true and you are on a mission from God or you don't have a purpose, purpose or mission at all. 
Jesus put it like this about you. And again, I, I, I point and speak to every single one of you. He said, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. You know, listen, others have come before us. Others will come after us. But this is your day. This is our day individually. And if God's kingdom were to manifest itself right now, today, it'll have to be through you. When I first read that line, that was a little bit scary. I was like, whew, suddenly that felt like a, a big responsibility. But I, I realized this is, the, this is the magnitude of the calling that God has placed on each of our lives, right? Even God himself won't come and take your place. If he were to manifest his kingdom today, it will be through you and I. So what we can infer from that is what we do, all right, what we do with the work of our hands, with this, with this calling, it matters immensely and it's worth devoting our best energy to. Again, I'm gonna say it again. You are on a mission from God. Okay, so the next thing he says we need to do then is we need to honor our raw material. So he says, discerning our calling requires one of the greatest challenges of self-exploration and judgment that a human being, human being can undertake. Callings are usually not easy to discover. And I want to repeat that because that sounds a little counterintuitive, right? Our callings are usually not easy to discover. You'll have to be ruthlessly honest about your gifts and your limitations, be willing to ask hard questions, and then to live with the answers. You'll also have to be willing to let some dreams die a painful death. And I love this. You did not arrive on this earth with your, your calling pre-qualified and your gifts pre-developed. Okay, so think about it, about it like this. When we, when we were born, there was no tag on us the moment we were born that said, hey, this is Bill. Uh, here's his unique uh, gifts and, and talents and longings and temperament. And this is precisely what he was created to do. We don't, we don't get that, that sort of tag. In fact, for most of us, if not all of us, if there was a tag, it would say some assembly required, right? So, so here's the reality. We have to pursue this calling. And I, I think like Jesus... And Peter, in this, in this narrative in Matthew 14, Peter had to, he had to do, he had to pursue. Yes, Jesus gave him the calling. He, he proclaimed the invitation, but Jesus had, or Peter rather, had to take that step out of the boat. He had to pursue it. And, you know, what, what we've read, and as Pastor Will has gone through these verses the last several weeks, what we see is, you know, Peter, Peter's, he's unsure, right? He's got some, he's got some questions, right? He's about to be called into new territory uh, for him. But the other thing that we have to do is we're, we're honoring our, our raw material is we, we have to debunk a couple of myths about our callings, okay? First thing is there's no such thing as a chosen calling. And I don't know if you've ever heard somebody or maybe you yourself have used this term or a similar term. Some people say, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I, f I feel like the, the calling that I've chosen is to do this, 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 and this. But really, that term, chosen calling, is an oxymoron. There's, there's really no such thing, okay? And we know this because the whole idea of calling in, in Scripture, well, first of all, it comes from Scripture, okay? And the whole idea of calling is infers that not only is there a call e, but there's a call er, right? Like when my kids are outside playing, and I'm uh, I, I step outside to call them in for dinner, I'm the caller, and my kids are the are the call e who respond to that that call. All right, there's a there's a duality there. There's there's two people interacting in in this exchange, okay? And then here's another myth that we have to debunk about our callings, you guys, and, it, and it's this. And I just want to say this. I believe that this myth about callings and, and identity is, has been one of the most stifling, if not killing, uh, uh, component or, or characteristic in, in undermining people exploring or, or discovering their callings. And it's this be anything that you want to be, or he calls it the limitless self-myth. Okay, and maybe some of you have heard something, something like that. Hey, you can be anything you want to be. He quotes a guy named Parker Palmer in the book. And this guy says, I was raised in a subculture that insisted I could do anything I wanted to, be anything I wanted to be, if I were willing to make the effort. The message was that both the universe and I were without limits. Given enough energy and commitment on my part, God made things that way, and all I had to do was get with the program. My trouble began, of course, when I started to slam into my own limitations, especially in the form of failure. And I bet if we all told our story, we could all relate to that in one way or another. So it's not about being all that we want to be, but it's about discovering, exploring who God has called us uniquely to be. Okay, then the next thing he says that we have to do is we have to assemble our own clearness committees, okay? 
So one of the hardest commandments in scripture to obey is, is this instruction that Paul gives to regard ourselves with sober judgment, okay? Or to come into an accurate assessment of my passion, my gifts, and my limits is one of the greatest challenges of this life because of our lack of self-awareness sometimes. And it does require tremendous self-awareness to explore your calling. But we are likely to need some help from other people to overcome our blind spots. And so he, he uses this term, clearness committee. For what it's worth, a clearness committee is a, a term that was first coined in the, in the Quaker community, okay? And so what the Quakers would do is anytime that w- one of the community were struggling with uh, understanding or exploring or discovering their unique calling, um, they would assemble about you know, half a dozen or so uh, brothers, sisters uh, in the faith who would, who would basically surround them. And, the, and then those people would ask them a series of hard questions. Now, he gives an example of some of these questions. I want to share them with you, but I want you, to, as I'm sharing, I want you to apply them to your own life. And, uh, and, and maybe later in the, in the recording, you can revisit these. But I will say that a couple of Wednesday nights when we went through these questions, these questions were quite compelling for quite a few of us. And here are some of the questions that a, cl- a clearness committee might ask you. What do, you endu- what do you enjoy doing for its own sake? What do you avoid doing? Why do you avoid doing it? For what do I want to be remembered? And how might the offer of money or promotion sidetrack me from my true calling? What would my life look like if it turned out well? So again, just some, some compelling questions that I, I, I bet would be difficult for some of us to answer, at least some of those questions if we ever took the time to stop and answer those, right? And I just, you know, I mentioned to the, to the crew here on Wednesday night that that's really a part of what we're trying to accomplish on Wednesday nights. And one of the reasons that we as a church encourage participation in a small group, not that a, that a small group within the church is the only means for, for creating this type of, of committee, but that's one of the things that we're trying to accomplish is, is surrounding ourselves with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ so that wherever we lack in, in our ability to, um, to, be, to have sober judgment or to be self-aware, we surround ourselves with trusted people who can help speak those truths and undermine those lies in our, in our lives, right? One thing I want to I just add here is, uh, and I, I, I felt compelled to mention this uh, uh, that night that I, that I first shared this, is that we have to avoid commiseration committees, Okay. For what it's worth, it seems like forming these committees is much, much easier, right? It's just a lot less work. Like, I, if I just stood up here and started complaining about my life and some of my circumstances and things like that, no, no doubt after service I'd have a collective of people going, you know what, I feel the same way. Let's, and, and you just lament, 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 complain, complain, complain. And believe me, it's not hard to find people who, who will not only not speak life into you, but will speak death over you for what it's worth. It's easy to find. So like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ to speak life into us and to, and to help us uh, become aware, raise our self-awareness of what's true and what's not, okay? The next thing he says, and I love this because this is, this is a very practical means for us to explore our unique callings. And he says we need to conduct low-cost probes, okay? And since discerning a calling usually requires time and patience, and most of us have bills to pay, right? What do we do while we're searching and exploring our calling? This process can be bad news for those of us who want to microwave everything, right? Including our vocations and our callings. We may be tempted to jump into commitments too rashly. One alternative is to conduct a low-cost probe. So here's the idea. It's to keep your day job, but to test the waters of a new calling, perhaps. So you get to begin exploring your effectiveness Um, in different areas or the area to which you believe that God may be calling you. Some examples might be a short-term mission trip. Maybe you've been interested in mission or serving that way. You can do a short-term mission trip. That way if if you blow it or uh, that's not, you know, you're not being called into full-time missions, uh, there might be a good way to explore that as well. Um, How about taking on a commitment to teach at the church or get involved as a volunteer launching a new ministry? And there are numerous other examples of things that we can do as low-cost probes to to explore our callings. And I I just want to say this, because if I'm completely honest with you, when I first read this, I thought, well, that sounds like a very faithless thing, right? Like, I always thought when I stepped into my calling, it it would be exactly like 
you know, like Peter did where Jesus said, come, and he just jumped out of the boat. But again, when you start going through Matthew 14, and, and Lowell's been doing a great job helping unpack this for us, but um, I, I don't perceive a Peter that just went, okay, it was a Peter that was like, uh, you know, all right, Lord, I've never, I've never, you know, stepped on this water. But also, Ortberg points out that there's actually a biblical precedent for, for folks, even some of the heroes of our faith who, who kept hold of or kept their, 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 uh, their, their, their current vocations going even while God was calling them into these ministries. Um, one example is Amos. Amos transitioned in the, into the prophecy business, uh, but he still had his shepherding position to fall back on. And even Paul, one of our heroes in the uh, New Testament, um, apparently kept his tent building business or his tent making operation um, in production, even while he was traveling around the, around the, the, the world planning churches. Okay? We even hear reference to his, his tent making business late in his, his ministry. All right, then here's the, here's the final thing that Ortberg challenges us to do as we're exploring our calling, is that we have to recognize that our calling and exploring, discovering our calling often involves pain. And that's probably not a very popular uh, theme or thing to point out, but here's the truth. Some more examples from Scripture. God called Moses. He told Moses, hey, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to tell him that he's got to release his entire labor force, but we're not going to compensate him for that so that they can go out and worship a God that he doesn't believe in. Okay? Then I want you to go to a, to a timid and stiff-necked people and convince them to run away into the, into the wilderness. Right? So this was Moses' calling. And Moses' response is, here am I, Lord. I want you to send Aaron. <laughs> Right? So that, that's, that's his response. And there are numerous other examples in, in almost every example, for, in fact, in Scripture where we see God calling somebody. There is difficulty in, the, in, the, in that, that exploration or stepping into that calling. Okay? And I, I just want to give this disclaimer, you guys. And here's where I want to shift the tone because you would think that this is a message specifically, uniquely about calling. And here's my prayer for all of us as individuals, but for us as a church family. My prayer is that all of us, as a, as a love act and in this love relationship with the Lord, that we, we do recognize that he loves us and us. Think about this. I said this to the Wednesday night group. All right, on the entire face of the planet, I don't know how many billions of people are on the, on the planet currently, but of all the people on the, on the face of the planet, you are uniquely made. Scripture says you were wonderfully and fearfully made. Think about this. You don't share the, the exact same DNA traits with any other person on the face of the planet. Okay, so again, we have universal callings as followers of Christ. We recognize that. But we have special and unique callings that are, that are specific to each of us. And the fact that he made us so vastly different from one another should be all the evidence that we, that we need that that's true. But here's the, here's the main disclaimer. And honestly, if you miss all the stuff about calling, I want you to leave here with this. Because this is, this is what the Lord really impressed upon my heart to emphasize in the house today, church. And it's this. That our calling is not an end, okay? Our calling is not an end. M many of us get this twisted. We think that if I could just discover what my calling is, that if I will just, if I could figure out what I was made to do, then I'll be happy, I'll be content, I'll be satisfied in this life, okay? But, but if you believe that your calling is the end, it is the goal itself, then you've, you've missed the point and you will never be content and satisfied. Our callings, like many other things, you guys, our calling is a means to an end. I would say our calling is a mean to the end. And what is that end? The end is Jesus. The end is Jesus. And I, I, will, I say this because I believe that many of us in our even well-intended pursuit of Jesus sometimes forget that our calling is not the goal of this life, but to be with Jesus. Listen, I, I shared with some staff even this week that, that, and I'll be the first to confess, even sometimes in our proclamation of the gospel or our presentation of the gospel message, one of the ways that, that I have, you know, sort of errantly conveyed the gospel is, uh, listen, God loved you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you so that you can live in heaven forever and you can avoid hell all right, and we share that, again, well-intended because we want people to come to know Jesus. But what we do in that, in that slight misrepresentation is we convey to people that heaven is, is even the goal. And believer, I'm here to tell you, heaven is not the goal for you, okay? All right, the only reason that we will enjoy heaven, it's not just because the streets are made of gold and the, you know, the, the gate's made out of a solid pearl and, and there's no more pain, suffering. All of that is wonderful. All of that's beautiful. All, right, all of that is magnificent. But heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. 
And we will walk with Jesus and we will enjoy him forever and ever and ever. Jesus is the end. He is, he is the goal of, of our faith and everything that we do, including walking out our unique callings. I'm going to read this passage from, uh, from Revelation. you are like, oh, Pastor Bobby's going real deep here today, okay? Uh, don't have time to unpack all of this, but about two years ago, the Lord started leading me on a journey through the book of Revelation. Um, helping me to understand some of the, you know, the, the, the symbolic uh, stuff that's in there. But here's a very simple call and exhortation and, and, and reminder from our Savior. So in the book of Revelation, through the Apostle John, Jesus is giving this prophetic words for many churches um, in the area at the time. And this is one of the, the messages. This was a letter that, that Jesus basically wrote and said to the, the church in Ephesus. And he says, I know your deeds and your labor and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have put those who call themselves apostles to the test and they are not and you have found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured on on account of my name and have not become weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And I love this. And sometimes when you're reading these letters in Revelation, they sound a little harsh, right? Because Jesus, it seems like Jesus is pointing out all the things that we're, that we're doing wrong. But as I was reading this and the Holy Spirit began to kind of shine a spotlight on some of these areas of growth for me as a believer, but I believe prophetically also for us as a church. Listen, any of our staff will tell you, we're in a real sweet time of ministry here at the church, meaning the Lord is bringing new people to us. There is this numeric growth that's happening. But I, I think this is why the Lord compelled me to share this message with you guys today so that we as a church in in the work of the ministry do not mistakenly forget or neglect our first love, Jesus. I'm going to read one more thing to you guys. This is, uh, it's actually just some excerpts from uh, a post from a guy named uh, Mike Bickle. He's He's the head of a a big effective ministry in uh, Kansas City that I've been following, whose ministry I've been following for quite a few years. And he posted this a couple of years ago, and, uh, and I just thought he articulates this, this point better than I ever could, so I'm gonna share with you from this to close. But he titles this, this post, Jesus, Our Primary Reward. So Jesus corrected the church in Ephesus for working hard in ministry without maintaining a fresh love and devotion for him. He exhorted them. You have labored for my namesake. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. They increased their ministry outreaches and networking while they decreased in their love for Jesus. Growth in ministry is good, but it can never replace our relationship with Jesus. The first commandment is to love God with all our heart. It is the first command, not the first option. It is God's first priority and he wants it to be ours. The Spirit is restoring the first commandment to first place in the church worldwide. This will empower us to love people more deeply and with more consistency. Ministry service without the foundation of intimacy with Jesus inevitably leads to burnout and thus to far less ministry in the long haul. Lovers always outwork workers. Satan's strategy is to distract from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus. He knows that if we lose this, we will be much more vulnerable to other things. We minister to God as the foundation of ministering on his behalf to others. We must intentionally cultivate a responsive heart of love to Jesus. It does not happen automatically. It is something that we must set our heart to do all the days of our life. Often today, the primary spiritual rewards we seek are more anointing for ministry, increased favor with people, or even economic prosperity. Yes, these are the blessings of God, but they are intended to be secondary. Our spiritual life is weakened when secondary blessings take first place in our lives. However, as the Holy Spirit reveals this love paradigm to us, the primary reward of the kingdom comes to the forefront. The anointing to experience and receive God's love and then to love him in return is the primary anointing to glorify God. Imagine how glorious life in the church will be when the Holy Spirit restores the first commandment to first place. As this transformation occurs, our efforts to serve the Great Commission will be less bruising. Working hard for God without the tenderizing work of being a lover often bruises us, often breaks us, and causes us to burn out. To work hard without this primary reward will eventually lead to burnout, which is so common today. 
We were never meant to function best as workers for God. Rather, God designed us in his image as lovers of God. Dutiful obedience and service will never reach the same depth of spiritual reality. A believer fascinated with God soon becomes a lovesick worshiper, one who is able to maintain an overflowing heart in God no matter how difficult the circumstances. When we are living with a fascinated, lovesick heart, our natural circumstances no longer dominate our thinking, even when people treat us wrongly. We find that the sacrifices we make to obey God have a new sweetness in them instead of being burdensome. And finally, church, a holy lovesick that empowers us to do the work of the kingdom is the secret of the martyrs. They are lovesick, lost in love. They don't care what they do, they just want to do it with him. They want to love and obey him, whether or not it's on the earth or as a martyr ushered into heaven. Their hearts are connected to a primary reward, which is to live overflowing in the experience of the love of God. Experiencing love from him, loving him in return, and then overflowing with love for people. This is the secret power of unity in the church, and it will be the key to the great harvest. The great commission will be fulfilled by people whose compassion for others flows from a heart that is full of love for God. And so church, as a wrap up, it occurred to me this week that, you know, it's been a long time since this altar up here has been, has been full, just packed full of people, standing room only. And so I, listen, I'm not, I'm not one for manufacturing holy moments or emotional moments. But I'm, I'm a huge proponent for giving the body of Christ opportunities to respond to God. So whether it's a response to, hey, maybe you're stuck. Maybe, maybe you know, you're, you're in a job that you're confident is not your calling. It's not what you were made to do. And you feel like maybe God is calling you out of that into something new. You want to you come and let, let prayer at this altar be a, be a starting point, be a, be a fulcrum point for you to, to launch into that, that next season of life. Maybe, maybe... The Holy Spirit is convicting your heart that, listen, you've been busy working for him, you know, trying to live a good life, but in some way, shape, or form, you've neglected your first love. I want to invite you to come as well. So as we always do, guys, the band is going to play. We, we build this, this time into our service every single week. This time is for you, and it's for God. It's, it's for you to respond to love in God the way he responds in love to you. All right, this is a means, a tangible means for us to do something uncomfortable for many of us, all right? That's the reason many of us don't ever come to the, to the altar. And listen, you can make an altar at your seat. You guys watching online, you can make an altar right there in your living room or, or kitchen table, where, wherever you are. But I think that God loves and is so blessed by this tangible act. I love that, the, that Jesus called Peter out of the boat and that uh, Peter wasn't sure about this stepping out of the boat, Matthew 14, right? But why did, why did Peter respond? Was it because he wanted to say, I could, I've done this cool thing? No, he wanted to be on the water because that's where Jesus was. And so for, for us, this is just an opportunity for us to respond to Jesus in a tangible way and say, we wanna be where you are. And then I believe our callings and everything else will flow from that love relationship. Let me pray for us and close. Heavenly Father, I, I'm grateful that you love us enough. Not, not only did you, did you send Jesus Uh, to be sacrificed, to die on the cross for our sins, Um, but then to be raised from the dead and and smite death forever, that we get to live with you forever. Um, But Lord, I look forward to heaven because that's where you are. That's where you ever will be. And I will get to enjoy that with you. Thank you for heaven, but thank you for the promise of Jesus, of Jesus, of Jesus, our primary reward. So God, I pray for us as individuals. I pray for us as a church body, a church family that you would help us. We need the Holy Spirit's help, ironically, to love you well. Help us to do so. And I pray for every single heart that responds in some tangible way today, that you rush to them, Lord, that they, they discover that you have, were closer than they perceived, just waiting, willing um, to invite them into this great adventure with you. I ask all this and pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Church, the altar is wide open as we stand and respond.